So Julia Ruth is a physicist and science educator turned circus performer. Julia received her bachelor's in physics at the University of Maryland while concurrently working at both NASA and NOAA, awarded a National Science Foundation graduate fellowship. She attended the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, where she completed her master's in geophysics. Since graduation, Julia has performed nationally and internationally as a circus performer, while teaching science in the classroom <clears throat> and online. Um, yes, my name is Julie Ruth and I am a circus artist. I used to be a scientist. I'm still very much involved in science, as Cheryl mentioned. Um, I have my undergraduate degree in physics and my graduate degree in geophysics. If I could have some help here again. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'll keep talking. Um, my, I've been teaching science for the past uh, two and a half years. Sorry, three and a half years, I still teach. And I um, have been a research scientist for about six years. I want to talk first about how I discovered my passion for science, because that's where this all began. In high school, I attended Hermann Busse Gymnasium, that's in Bremen, Germany. I showed up in Germany not knowing any German at all and was placed into a German-speaking school, so that was a big challenge for me, and that was where I took my first physics class. I totally fell in love with physics here. Even though there was a language barrier, I was in completely enthralled with my coursework, and I tried to get involved in physics as much as I could while I was there. When I returned to the States, I attended a science and tech magnet school where I had to do a year-long research practicum my senior year in order to graduate. I wrote a six-chapter thesis on the existence of dark matter, theoretically proving that mathematically. Um, and then uh, that project was actually done at the University of Maryland, right by where I grew up. And so I decided to attend the University of Maryland and keep with the physics department there. I switched my research over to LIGO, which is Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. I did not work at the facility. I worked at the University of Maryland, and I created a program to um, help us better understand which telescopes are facing what portion of our sky at any given time. That way, when we receive gravitational waves from a certain point, we can pinpoint where that is, take a picture, snapshot, see what's created those gravitational waves. So I'm flying through the science here because I'm sure you're all very curious about the circus. So um, I then discovered my passion for performance around this time. I started with this group called Gymkhana. It was a gymnastics and acrobatic organization at the University of Maryland. It was just a club, a student activity that I decided to join for fun. I thought it would be something really different and interesting um, to do on the side of my studies. And that was where I fell in love with performance. I hadn't really anticipated that. I had never performed a day in my life. I had absolutely no experience with gymnastics. So um, it was a little bit funny that I fell in love with this. But the adrenaline of performing was really addicting. Um, we were inspiring audiences to live healthy lives. And that was really exciting for me. And this idea that hard work pays off. Setting goals and accomplishing those goals were really rewarding. Like I said, I had no experience, so I was awful when I started, absolutely atrocious. And my coach found out that I was a physics major, and he decided to explain the skills that I was learning in terms of physics. And that was when things started to click and when I finally started to get a little bit better. Uh, of course, balancing the two as an undergrad was extremely challenging. I did work as a research scientist during that time. I started at NASA with an internship. I was studying uh, the Antarctic ice sheet, looking at the thickness of the ice sheet and how that, that's changed over time to look at precipitation in Antarctica. That resulted in a paper that I'm a co-author on. And then I switched locations to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, where I continued to study ice, but this time sea ice, so frozen ocean water in the North Pole. And that also <coughs> resulted in a co-author in a paper. Of course, I've been doing coursework all during this time as well. Um, and I had the amazing opportunity to take graduate level courses as an undergrad, thanks to a program at my school. 
that's the science side, that's the, the study side, the academia. Now the other side was that I was spending hours and hours a week in the gym training gymnastics. That wasn't enough, I had to build my strength and flexibility and endurance. So I was cross training with things like climbing, aerobic exercises, weightlifting, anything that I could do that would be really beneficial for my gymnastics training given that I hadn't had any before. Uh, we were creating acts, it's a performance, right? So we have these acts that we're putting on and that takes time to choreograph um, music. I have to pick out music, I have to edit music, we have to pick costumes, we have to make costumes. So all that took time outside of my training. Uh, and then of course we were performing. So we would go on the road to perform at local elementary, middle and high school, some colleges as well to promote our healthy living lifestyle and show our um, hard work. And uh, we did some campus shows as well, some halftime shows for our basketball team and an end of the year show to kind of accumulate our progress throughout the year. I then went on to grad school. I was still really excited about science. I didn't want to give it up. I loved performance, but I thought, mm, I need a real job. All right, so I went to the uh, University of California, San Diego and attended the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I was in their PhD program for geophysics. I was very fortunate to get a National Science Foundation graduate student fellowship to attend as well as a departmental scholarship to attend. Um, I chose San Diego over many other options for two key reasons. Number one, it's San Diego. The sun is always out and the ocean's right there. Um, but the real obvious choice for me was that there's the San Diego Circus Center. So in San Diego, there is a circus school that's very prominent and very well known for being very competitive. And I wanted to be there because I wanted to continue what I had done as an undergrad. I wanted to continue studying science. I wanted to continue performing on the side. And performing no longer looked like gymnastics at this opportunity. It was now circus. Of course, I had to balance the two in grad school as well. So classes, of course. Um, I decided to do some research on the side too. That was not mandatory in my first year of grad school. But I was really excited about continuing with the ICE research that I had started at NASA and NOAA. And then uh, studying for the departmental exams. Uh, took up a lot of my time. Despite that, I was still in the gym training three or more hours a day for my uh, circus performance, training strength and flexibility, as well as some specialties, which I'll talk about later. I decided to coach on the side as well. So I coached at the school on some of the things that I was better at and knew how to coach rather than the other specialties that I was still learning at the time. And then performing as well, because I had to be performing to keep myself satisfied with that side. I decided to ultimately leave grad school early. I finished one school, I got through one year, I'm sorry, one year, I got through one year and I thought, okay, it's now or never for me, for, for circus, for performance. I'm getting older every day, as we all are, and my body can only handle this for so long. So I thought, I can always come back to school, I can always come back to being a research scientist, I can't go back to being a circus performer when I turn 60. All right, so um, that was the mentality I had. I also felt like my research wasn't making an immediate impact. I was making an impact in climate change science, but I didn't feel that impact every single day. I, I wasn't getting that feeling. And circus was something that was more fulfilling for me at that time. I was very passionate about science, but I was even more passionate about circus in a way that I, I honestly don't have words for. They always say, if you know, you know, and that I knew. Um, I did receive my master's degree in that first year. I completed all my coursework and I passed my departmental exams. And since I already had co-author uh, papers, uh, they let me go with my master's degree. So not only was it an incredibly invaluable year in my life, um, I have something to show for it too. So that was exciting. I didn't want to leave science completely. I became an educator. Um, this is me in my sixth grade classroom. I taught sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. I um, felt like this was my way to be involved with science in a way that I was making an impact every single day. I could see the looks on my students' faces. I could talk to them one-on-one -on -one and see how inspired they were to go into science, see how excited they were about the course material. Like I said, I taught uh, middle school. Um, sixth grade was physical science, so I was using my undergrad degree. Seventh grade was life science, so I had a lot to learn before I could teach that. And then eighth grade with Earth, was Earth and Space Science, which I could use my geophysics degree in. Of course, also information for my research for all three of those. I ultimately left being in a brick and mortar situation in the classroom to teaching online because I wanted more flexibility with my schedule. I was fortunate in the three and a half years I was in the classroom that we had summers off, we had winter break, spring break, 
right? Um, so in those times I was performing and then during the school year I was teaching, but I wanted to be performing full time and I didn't wanna let go of teaching. So I did continue to be an educator online. I still am to this day. I still teach classes every week. I taught English as a second language to students in China. That was one of the most amazing online teaching experiences I've had. Um, I teach workout and flexibility classes for students who are at home and don't have access to that, or are dancers, gymnasts, things like that, looking for a little cross-training themselves. I teach astronomy classes and modern physics. Modern physics is probably my favorite to teach because I teach a um, general relativity, quantum physics, and string theory class for middle school students. And creating that curriculum was really challenging, but really fun to find a way to take these really complex topics and break them down so that 12 to 14 year olds could understand them. I've gotten a lot of great feedback from students and parents on um, that class. So that's really exciting. Um, and then the astronomy classes, because they're um, extracurricular, it's a lot of homeschooled students that I'm teaching. So these classes are extracurricular for them. So I'm very fortunate that the students students that I'm getting in my classes are students who really want to be there. And even though it's this online interface, which can be hard for young kids, um, they're captivated and they're involved in the class. And it's just, it's really rewarding for me as well. I really enjoy it. Okay, circus. What does my daily life look like as a circus performer? I think a lot of you are probably wondering. Um, I'm a, what's called a freelance circus performer. I don't have a full-time job. I don't have a salary. Okay, I'm working different contracts here and there. It's a very nomadic lifestyle. All right, so in the just past two years alone, and I've been, I've been performing professionally for seven, performing total 11 years. Just the past two years alone, I've lived in four different cities, over two countries and two states. I've performed in seven states, and many of them for months at a time. So um, sometimes I'll get a call, say, hey, we want you for this contract. It's two months, it starts next week. Can you move? and I have to take my suitcases and move for two months somewhere new. And that might sound terrifying for some of you. It's amazing, I love it. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side that I am packed up with my suitcases. I've been living out of these suitcases for two years now. Um, no permanent home. I, um, like I said, I move a lot. So even the sort of quote unquote permanent homes I've been in, I've been in seven in the past two years. So I never really feel like I fully settled down anywhere. No nine to five schedule, every single day for me looks completely different. There is some regularity and I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's a lot that's up in the air and there are many mornings I wake up and I have no idea what I'm gonna do for the rest of the day because jobs come up last minute all the time. I work weekends and holidays mostly, um, unless it's a long contract and I'll work every day, but most of our jobs are weekends and holidays, which I really enjoy. On contract, this varies a lot. This is my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues. I may work five to 10 hours a day on site. Um, it's not performing, obviously, the whole time. We have lots of breaks in between shows, time to put on makeup and costumes, things like that. Anywhere from one to four shows a day. One is ideal, I've done four, and it takes a lot on the body, but it's doable. Uh, 12 to seven days a week, so sometimes it's just the weekend, sometimes it's every day of the week, maybe four days out of the week. And then there are off days, of course, when we can have them. And for me, off days are for rest, they're for exploring the area, and they're for bonding with my cast members. Every single contract I have, totally different crew of people. Sometimes I'll see an old friend here and there again, um, but for the most part, I'm meeting new people everywhere I go, making new friends, and it's nice to have that time. That's probably my favorite part of performing is the traveling and the getting to know people. So I try to take advantage of that as much as I can. Off contract looks a little bit different. Um, I am sort of in these, um, I'm home, so to speak, whatever that looks like, right? I am training every day that I can possibly train. Um, three to six hours of training per day. I try not to do more than six, although there are some days where I hit eight. I train my specialties on those uh, when I'm training. Oh, it's not six hours of pumping iron, okay? So it's it's a few hours of working my specialties, which I'll talk about and show some videos in it for a second. In a second, um, I am working on my strength. I'm working on my flexibility. These are vital for everything that we do in circus. Um, and then rehab, prehab. So unfortunately, um, I can probably say that me and all of my colleagues, we've all endured injuries, big, small, anything in between. 
I've been very fortunate that I don't have a lot of injuries that I'm recovering from. And, um, but this still takes time to make sure that I'm rehabilitating my body to make sure that I can continue to keep performing as long as possible. And then that's where prehab also comes in to play. I'm thinking ahead about what injuries I might endure and strengthening my body in a way where then I can be prepared and hopefully then not get injured. I'm trying to keep my body going for at least another 10 to 15 years of this. Um, for those of you who are wondering, I am 29. Um, and I have plenty of friends and colleagues who are in their 40s and actually 50s still performing. So it's doable as long as you really work hard to keep your body safe. So off contract, that's a big role of mine. Um, physical therapy, athletic training, massage, acupuncture, it's all part of the job. I have to say I love getting tax write-offs for massages. Um, it is, it's necessary and it's very much a part of the job. And then we'll sometimes have these gigs, corporate, uh, corporate gigs we call them, where someone might call me up and say, hey, there's a conference taking place locally. Can you come and perform for us? Um, you know, five minutes, do your act, leave. Uh, that's a lot of fun, too, because you're performing for people who didn't expect to see circus. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of jaw drops, and it's really exciting to see that kind of audience, very different than working on a stage. Uh, sometimes I travel, but most of them are local. For me, local is Las Vegas and Southern California. I drive a lot around that area. Okay, this is the biggest part of being a circus performer, especially a freelance performer. It's the hustle. Okay, so that means auditioning. There are auditions in person, there are auditions online. Um, I have to create or I have to gather photos and videos of everything that I do. So I make sure that all of my shows are photographed and um, there's videography of it. I hire photographers and videographers to get footage of me performing. Um, this is all promotional material that I use to then sell myself, okay? So I have to contact companies myself, try to promote myself through them. Networking is a big part of it. I create my own acts. So I'm choreographing and creating my own acts, and that is how I'm selling myself, okay? So I'm saying this is something that I'm capable of doing. This is my show. Um, would you like to feature my show in your greater show or in your... Um, company, maybe you have a presentation you want, or um, a conference, right? I'm big on social media. I hate social media, but I get a lot, a lot of work out of it, so I have to keep up with that. And then costume creation. Um, some, of the, some of the stuff I'll, I'll hire out other people to do. If it's a complicated costume, I'll hire a seamstress to make it for me. Um, but for the most part, I'm, I'm coming up with my own costume ideas and creating them myself. Um, helps keep costs down, so. All right. Here are my specialties. Um, the biggest one that I do, the one that I get hired for the most, um, is called Sear Wheel. It's a big metal ring that I stand in. I spin around in it. I dance with it. Um, it's about 40 pounds of <coughs> aluminum. Um, it's kind of hard to picture, so I have a quick video for you to see here. Does it fit in a suitcase? It does fit in a suitcase. It comes apart into five pieces. Great question. So this was a performance that I did at a circus festival. I won first place at this festival, actually. And then here's um, at a circus center in Las Vegas. And this final clip here was actually from a holiday contract, hence why I'm dressed like a candy cane. Um, but the wheel itself is actually lighting up. That's not just an illusion. There are LED lights on it. So Sear Wheel is probably my favorite for a few reasons. Um, the biggest being that it so clearly demonstrates the laws of physics. I think maybe we're all in here kind of nodding our heads. I see, OK. <laughs> I don't have to explain that in detail, do I? Um, I do a couple of other things. Oh, I'll keep going here. Hand-to-hand um, -hand is another favorite of mine. That's me on the bottom. I'm holding up my flyer um, as she's called. I'm a base, and that's my flyer, who is in a handstand on me. This was a show in Montreal. Um, I'll show you a little bit more, because it is a very dynamic thing, so I'll show you a couple clips from this as well. Again, I'll be on the bottom for all of these, and actually this one in the middle. Oh. 
<laughs> I'm hearing some sounds. Um, there's a lot of training that goes into this. Um, so hand-to-hand -hand is an, a really nice one because it's clear teamwork. Um, I love being able to work with other people. And again, this is physics as well, all right? We're finding ways to counterbalance. We're finding ways to move dynamically and safely through the air, catching and releasing, things like that. So um, again, I don't think I need to go into detail on the physics. I think we're all seeing it here. Um, Spanish web is another one that I do. This is an aerial apparatus, so this is not on the ground. I am, in this picture, I'm holding my hand in a loop. And um, I can also put my foot into that loop. And someone is at the bottom holding this rope that you see going on the left side, that arc shape. And someone is spinning that rope, spinning me around really quickly. So I can either be holding it with my hand or in this video I'm about to show you, I'm actually hanging by my foot. I hope you can see that clearly. I know it's a bit small. Um, I, a lot of people ask me all the time if I get sick. Uh, I don't, typically. My body's pretty accustomed to it. But I learned if I train too long, I will be hurling in the bushes outside. You keep your eyes closed? My eyes are open. Mm -hmm. My eyes are open. If anyone's curious how to not get dizzy with your eyes open, we can talk later. There are some tricks for it, but I don't have time for that now. Um, a couple other things that I do on the side, I get a lot of work for these things, uh, for corporate performances and, and one-off gigs, so to speak. Uh, stilt walking, stilt jumping, you can see on the picture all the way to the left that I am indeed jumping on those stilts. Um, I do a lot of puppetry. These aren't small puppets, these are extremely large puppets that I've worked with, um, and a lot of character work. And I put these all on one side because they're all kind of intertwined. As you can see in the second picture from the left, I am on stilts, I have a puppet, and I'm doing character work. So um, they're all very intertwined. Like I said, I'll show you a quick clip of these as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you caught on that last one. That's double dutch with the... <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of fun. Um, again, physics is a part of all of these, of everything that I'm doing here. They all demonstrate physics, I think, very clearly. Everything that we do in circus, anytime we're moving our body, gymnastics, performance, whatever it is, dance even, it's all physics. But I think just the visualization of, of physics in these apparatuses that I do in particular is just so clear. Uh, for sear wheel in particular, of oh, that big metal ring again, um, I train that a lot on my own. I don't have, co there are only very few people in the world that do that. Um, and so I don't always have a coach nearby. So I'll film myself performing it, practicing it, training it. And if I'm having the same problem happen over and over again, I'll look back at that footage and I'll say, okay, my right foot is stepping out and falling off every time to the right. How can I adjust my body to affect my center of mass? How can I think about the acceleration? I'm, I'm looking at it from a very physics um, viewpoint which I think a lot of my colleagues don't do. I think they're very quick to be like, ah, this isn't working. I don't know what to do. Move on. OK. Um, the beautiful thing about circus is that I get to call myself a professional athlete. I also get to call myself a professional artist. It is really 50-50 of both. Um, so that's really exciting, because I've always wanted to be an athlete, um, an athlete, a professional athlete that was a dream as a little girl. And the fact that I get to be an athlete and an artist is just really unique. And I think that's unique to circus performance. There's a lot of value in entertainment in society. I think a lot of people might look at it and feel like it's frivolous, it's not very important, but there's a lot of value to it. Um, art is a beautiful way to process, process emotions, process experiences. Um, the picture you can see on the bottom is a very emotional picture, um, if you can see it clearly. Um, that was a routine that I had created actually for an audition for Cirque du Soleil, and I had created that piece based on some trauma that I'd endured as a child. And for me, it was a beautiful way to process that trauma. And it was very therapeutic for me. And I can tell you honestly that so many more of my colleagues have gone through similar um, creative processes as well. Um, it can be a beautiful escape from reality, OK? Like in the Great Depression, when everyone went to the movies to escape from their lives, I mean, entertainment is still that today. Um, it can be an invitation into another reality. If anyone's ever seen Cirque du Soleil, that's all of their shows. Every single show is about taking you and transporting you into a totally new made-up world. 
really fascinating. Um, with performance comes a lot of inspiration that can be really inspirational towards audiences. I have audience members who come up to me all the time and tell me how I've inspired them in one way or another. And it's really touching to hear that. Um, and it brings together people, this idea of connection. It connects me to people all around the world. It connects people to each other around the world. There are a lot of similarities between circus and science. All right, so we're gonna bring this full circle here. I think that science and circus artists, is, it's a symbiotic relationship for me. The more I participate in science, the more successful I am as a circus artist and vice versa. So speaking in front of people like I am today is making me a better performer in the circus world and vice versa. I've gotten a lot more confident with speaking in front of people like this or in smaller groups or even larger auditoriums um, because of performing in front of people as well. It's strengthened my communication um, body language is a big part of communication, and so that's strengthened in the world of circus, because I'm not talking so much in those performances. And then here in science, um, again, communication is vital. Um, applying for jobs and how I present myself, again, symbiotic relationship. I have been extremely successful in getting jobs in the circus world because I learned how to be competitive in the world of academia. I learned how to apply for jobs, create resumes and things like that. And while our resume in circus looks way different, believe it or not, I have to put my height and weight and body dimensions <laughs> and hair color on my resume. Um, I don't obviously do that in science. Uh, I, by being competitive in the world of science, gives me an edge on all of the people that I'm competing against for jobs in circus by knowing how to be professional. And that's not something that you learn in the world of art necessarily, uh, being an artistic performer. Um, and teamwork, teamwork in both. Um, I don't wanna necessarily elaborate on that. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention is that a lot of circus performers that I know actually come from the world of science. I don't think I'm that unique in that. Um, I have friends who are professional engineers, professional physicists, chemists, biologists. A lot of crossover with physical therapy because that's a little bit more connected. Um, but a lot of circus performers come out of science more than I think any other field. So I think that's really interesting for those of us who came from somewhere else first. Um, there's opportunity for higher education in circus. So L'Ecole Nationale de Cirque is a national circus school in Montreal. There's the next one on the list is in Australia. Then we have Rotterdam, Netherlands, Stockholm, Sweden. And actually all of these schools and more, there are plenty on the list. You can get a bachelor's in circus arts. Okay, and it's, and it's an incredible degree. Um, Stockholm University for the Arts actually has a master's degree and a PhD in circus research. So that's an option as well. And they're very well um, admired. You're much more competitive in performance environment if you have these degrees. Here I am working at Le Col National de Cirque in Montreal. Um, this is their creation studio. They have a huge facility. This is only one of their studios in that whole facility. I had the opportunity to do an artistic residency there. Um, uh, it's one of the most competitive circus school. It's what I call the Harvard of um, the circus world. It's the most competitive circus school to get into and to have the opportunity to do an artistic residency there was just unbelievable because you have access to some of the best trainers, coaches, and um, artistic directors in the world. So that was a really amazing experience and just such a beautiful space to be in and create in. Um, so research is a big part of circus. Believe it or not, when we create acts and when we're developing acts, we're developing shows, there's a lot of research that goes into that. Research looks a little bit different than it does in the world of science, however. There's a lot of improvisation. I spend a good chunk of time of my training just putting on some music that really moves me in the moment and or something that's totally out there and I hate, and it just gives me an opportunity to find new skills, new pathways, new movements. Um, a lot of it's play. We get paid to play. We're, we're children and doing these fundamental movements of play to create something that is then going to be able to be inspirational for other people. Uh, watching and attending other shows is a big part of our research. I try to attend as many circus shows as I can, even theater and dance, anything that I think might be relevant. Uh, I study other artists, I study their acts, um, just like anything in the world. When we're creating something new, we're not creating something fresh from nothing. We're building on something that already exists. And the same thing is true in circus. Um, there, there's this opportunity to introduce new elements, new skills, new apparatuses. And um, this is done very frequently. Uh, it sets you apart from everyone else. If you can create something that looks visually very brand new, it's very marketable. Again, it's that hustle, we're trying to market ourselves. 
And then studying circus history is a big part of that as well, again, building on what already exists. Outreach is also a big part of circus. There's what's called social circus. Um, it's outreach program for students. Actually, this exists all throughout the world. Um, it's a medium for social justice. Um, we're promoting individual wellness in those students. Um, it uplifts the role of art and culture, bringing that more into the forefront and recognizing its importance in our society. And the nice thing is it develops self-esteem, solidarity, and trust within the people and the groups and the teams that are working in social circus. So I want to end um, on this note here. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said this beautiful quote, um, where she talks about how you can gain strength, you can gain courage and confidence every time that you do something that challenges you, every time you do something that scares you, if you're doing that, you're, you're growing as a person, okay? So you, she's encouraging you to do the things that you think you cannot do. And that's what I've spent so much of my life doing is finding things that scare me and then doing them, okay? It's made me the person I am today, and it's making me the person I will be in the future, All right? So... Taking that leap, leaving grad school um, in a PhD program with a National Science Foundation scholarship was a terrifying thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. And it was not well received by my parents originally, mm -hmm. um, as you can probably imagine. And uh, it, was, it was really scary. I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't have, I didn't have anything. And I just knew that what I was doing felt right in the moment. And so I went for it. Two feet in is gonna allow you to be more successful. That was the thing. I was, for so long, I was kind of dipping my toes in the water and I was like, okay, I can do both, I can do both. I needed to jump two feet in into something that was a little bit more time dependent of, okay, I'm getting older, I need to get through, uh, do this now before it's too late. So I really wanna encourage you to follow your passions. Every time you take this leap, I encourage you to do it every day even small leaps, every time you do, you grow as a person, you reach to new boundaries, and you really challenge yourself to being a stronger uh, human being. Um, and I'm not sitting here, my talk isn't about you leaving circuit, uh, science for circus, okay? Your passions can be related to your family, vacations, hobbies, um, science, of course, right? We're all here for a reason, we are passionate about science. I still keep my toes in the water for science, and I plan to jump two feet back into science when I'm done with, my, my body's done with circus, okay? So um, I am at the end of my time, so I want to end here. I'm gonna leave these references up for just a moment. If anyone's watching the playback, they can pause. Um, and I wanna say thank you to you all for being here um, and witnessing my talk. I wanna thank Cheryl and the APS for having me and inviting me to give this talk. Um, and I'd love to take any questions that you have. Okay, so uh, I do see um, a couple of questions on the, on the Slido here, but I think you've actually uh, really answered the first one, which was any skills that being a physicist and circus performer have in common. But I think you, you did that already. The second question is, how much of your act is strictly choreographed versus improvised? What do you see as the role of improvisation in circus performance? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I always, most of the time, I go in with something strictly choreographed, and then I just go off the books. Um, what I do in Sear Wheel with that big metal ring um, is very dependent on the floor that I have. And so oftentimes when I go somewhere, no one's scouted the um, event space for me yet. And so I just kind of show up, and I see what it is, and then I kind of improvise. So. Improvisation is important in my training because I have to do that on the job often because I don't know what I'm going to get. Sometimes someone will call me and say, hey, we need you this afternoon. You're going to be a character. Cool. All right. I show up. They're like, okay, you're a zebra. <laughs> it's just an example. Um, but then I have to come up with that character and improvise in that character on the spot. When I'm working with a team member, it's very different. It's very strictly choreographed. There is still some room for improvisation, but it's harder to communicate that between each other in the moment. Um, so the answer is a little bit of both. Questions in the room, please come up and use the microphone so the people online can hear you. While he's coming up to ask a question, I should mention that the top one is my website. The rest of the information you can get from my website as well, but feel free to contact me with more questions that way too. Oh, you want to hire her. Get your institution <laughs> to hire her. <laughs> uh, so my question is just, you mentioned that uh, amongst people who have switched from being something else to being a circus performer, there's a large number of 
scientists and mm -hmm. I guess like kind of po people who left academia of some sort. Um, and that you're planning on doing, you know, going back to science at some point later on. Is that something that you've seen other circus performers do, like perform, you know, in circus and then one day after they're, I don't know, once they get older, switch back and go back into academia again? Or is that just kind of like a more unique plan of your own? That's a situation? great question. Um, so everyone's path in circus is absolutely unique. Um, how they got into it, how they left it, what they do in, in circus is unique to everyone. Um, for me, that, like I said, that's my plan. Um, I know people who, who are similar in that way, and then I think a lot of people in circus go on to coach or open circus schools um, or choreograph for other organizations or start their own companies themselves. So I want to say that everyone's path is absolutely different. This is a serious question. I'm wondering how much sleep you got in your first year of grad school. Um, that's a great question. I um, I really value sleep, so I tried to get as much as I could because I'm not going to be a good performer and I'm not going to be able to train unless I get my eight hours. So believe it or not, I did. Um, my studies were the was the thing that kind of fell to the side a little bit. My, then my next question was what fell by the wayside in your yeah. first year trying to balance all of that? Yeah, I did not always turn in my homework. Uh, yes, please come forward and use the microphone. We have uh, 44 people online who can't hear you unless you use the microphone. Yeah, thanks for your talk. It was very inspiring. And I would like to know what are the options to put down roots in your profession and you will be seeking that somewhere in the future. Uh, my profession is a scientist. In no, in the circus. Or, oh, in the circus. What roots I've put down to be more successful in the future? No, if it's possible to, like, because you say you move a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's possible to, like, find a way to work in the same place and be there for maybe absolutely. years. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So I have some friends who have what are called residential shows. And um, it's exactly what it sounds like. You have a show in one stage, in one place. Your contract is usually a year long, and you can renew that each year. So a lot of Cirque du Soleil shows in Las Vegas, for example, are resident shows, and you get a salary. Um, you can make six figures as a circus performer in a residential show, easy. Um, and so then, then a lot of people then buy homes and settle down and have families and continue to work in the circus that way. That's good. Would you like to do that at some point? Maybe at some point, but I, I love traveling too much right now that the thought of having to settle down somewhere actually sounds really scary to me. I'd rather be moving to a new location every two months. That's just me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs>